Okay, so uh, what I would like to uh, let what I would like to uh, mention here to make clear. I think we I discussed it uh, a bit last time, but uh, we should uh, we should have the the definition clear when we take a plate. So co-dimension zero. In co-dimension zero, we have plates. And if we have a plate, then it's defined modulo, uh, modulo higher co-dimensions. So if you have a plate which looks uh, roughly like this, then you have really a union. You think of it as a union of these open shards. Remember that the shards are the the complex, the simplicial complex obtained by, so these are open shards. This is, the shards are the simplicial complex made by the special hyperplanes. And the special hyperplanes were uh, XS, which is a sum of I in S of XI is equal to some number n in, in z. Yes, so you have the open, so you, you intersect, uh, the, you, you, uh, you cut uh, the, the ambient space, which is sum of x uh, i equal to sum uh, n, cut, with this, and these these give you the shards. And now, when you have a, a similarly, when you have a a uh, blade, it's defined with open. So, for the blade, you take these open shards. And here it's uh, in the rest it's undefined. Uh, similarly, here it's undefined, for instance, in the center. Yes. If you take a full blade, you also add to this the dot, but this lives in another space where you see only dots. Yes, so you have a co-dimension zero. So the dot does not live in this space. Yes, so each, uh, each, each dimension lives in a separate space. Otherwise, you, you get into problems as to what is defined where. Uh, one more observation. Remember that we, we had uh, the following properties of... Uh, of uh, uh, plates and blades. We, namely, the plates and blades map into trees, and we have some properties, properties of the image properties of the image of, uh, of this map. So the image is not all the linear combinations of trees. Um, also, let's say that if we, if we write that uh, 3, 1 plus 3, 2 equals to 3, 3, what we mean by this is that uh, um, this means that the coefficients in the image satisfy that relation. So it's a shorthand. Okay, for instance, the uh, uh, the Jacobi identity yes, the coefficients of the trees with uh, labels permuted, the sum of those coefficients is zero. 
So let me let us write here the properties of these uh, of this image. Uh, one is uh, delayering, and they are observed simply. The the proof is so the delayering is that if you have a, a tree and if you have two nodes uh, of a tree which are at different heights, then uh, then they can be put in the other order as well. Uh, So this means that the trees, uh, so the, uh, uh, the, these are then trees for the asoshahedron. Not permutohedron. Yes, which means that you have a tree like this for instance, which has nodes lifted as high as possible. Yes, these are the trees which appear in the expansion of the Asoshahedron. Let me lift a little bit the screen. So the proof of this, the proof of this property is that uh, uh, is that it's uh, uh, we have put uh, when we wrote the expansion this was satisfied by the expansion remember that what we did for the expansion was we took a plate or blade and we separated it we lumped it and then we put all trees Underneath, we are respective properties, and finally, in the end, we did the uh, anti-symmetrization. Yes. So when we put all the trees, it's clear that the coefficient of this is the same as the coefficient of that. Um, also. Uh, so this is a first property, delayering, which means that the, we can work with non-layered trees. Two is, of course, uh, uh, anti-symmetry by definition. This is by the last step there. The anti-symmetry was, in, was introduced so that we, uh, we can glue things in uh, uh, algebraic topology because uh, uh, so things cancel when we glue. Please uh, ask if you have any question. Uh, three is the uh, Jacobi identity, Jacobi. And this is because uh, if you have A, B, C, which may be fairly complicated trees uh, themselves, and uh, then they appear one way and the other way, this way. If you have two subsets, and uh, anti-symmetrization, and uh, uh, notice that uh, that in the blade case, so for blades, we take the cyclic permutation. So in the in the blade case, we take uh, not just the initial order of the blade, but also all the cyclic. Permutations. However, these uh, 
since there are uh, there are more than two trees in the forest, it means that if you have an A, B, C in order, then there is somewhere also a D. So this means that C, A, B does not appear. Yes, because there would be the D in between. So what this shows then is that once you reform, once you put it back here, this shows that the coefficient of uh, A, B, C plus the coefficient of uh, B, C, A plus the coefficient of uh, C, A, B is zero. So this means coefs of, because uh, these give a plus one for A, B, C, for instance, and for B, C, A, uh, this one when you rearrange it, this would be CAB. So this gives you a plus one, this gives you a negative one, and this will be a zero, this does not appear. So every generator satisfies the Jacobi identity, so since this is linear, we take linear combinations of generators, the Jacobi identity will be respected. And four was uh, for blades, in all core dimensions, we had uh, the following property that if you if you had a B between A and C, yes, there was uh, this branch B could be appear could appear uh, could be connected to A, and uh, B could be connected to C. which is a negative of uh, uh, A and uh, CB. So this means that uh, if you take here a forest, without uh, some uh, three uh, B, and then you add the B in all possible ways. So you add it to the forest in all possible ways. You B on the same side. The sum of this is zero. This is a very important one. The, the first uh, three uh, are known in the theory of free Lie algebras, and you can see the Lie algebras uh, in a book by Christoph Reutenauer. Well, this one appears not to have been seen before. Uh, now, using these properties, using these properties, so first of all, uh, we uh, uh, le let's let's try to find which trees are linearly independent. So for plates, uh, using the Jacobi identity, uh, you can. Uh, First of all, no, yes, l let's use a Jacobi identity and let's use it in the following way, that if you have an A, B here, and the rest is here, there's a C, then this is equal to uh, A, B, C, 
minus B A C. Yes? By the way, this should be very familiar to you if you did the differential geometry, yes? Uh, you can think of uh, putting the branch on the left as a, uh, so this would be something like nabla AB is equal to nabla A, nabla B. Yes, where this nabla A means that you put an A as a branch. So, uh, because of this, this means that all uh, all nodes uh, can be pushed pushed right. Yes, so that in the end you get uh, uh, three only trees like this, which are called the uh, right comb. And in this right comb trees, in such a right comb tree, you can also, using the same, using the anti, using the Jacobi again, plus the anti-symmetry, you can uh, put one at, or, or um, uh, this is a lump, lump containing one at the top. You can push it, switch it and with Jacobi and, and uh, put it at the top. So, And after that, you have a basis. So these form a basis. And uh, the corresponding uh, uh, plates are the following. If uh, the plate, so this is a plate with S1 uh, up to Sn with a property that uh, one is in S1, form a basis. And we'll write the relations which bring these to the basis using the trees. We'll do that if we have time. If not, the relations will be put. Uh, well, the relations we can write, but uh, Let's not do it right now. Are there any questions? So, so these form a basis, the comb trees with one at the top, yes? And for the plates, the plates which have one in the first lump. Yes, so uh, if we are in the plane, let's say, then uh, these plates will be like this. So the directions of the coordinates, so these are chords. Uh, remember that what we do is we take, uh, we take the standard basis uh, and we project onto the sum of coordinates is constant, yes? So this is a picture of the standard basis as you look along the along the diagonal x1 is equal to x2 is equal to x3. Yes, so this is sum of xi is equal to zero. And in this case, the plates which form a basis are the following, the whole plate, then the uh, upper one, so all the ones which contain one, yes? Because this contains one here and uh, then these and this. Yes, so these uh, uh, so these are at uh, uh, oh, and here also uh, this 
this one and this one. Yes, so these these plates, uh, this contains a one here. So these plates form a basis. You can write uh, any plate as a linear combination of these. Uh, if you take them uh, around the point, that's, those are the, the plates. If not, you have to shift them in all possible ways to get the affine basis. Uh, For co-dimension one blades, which are, at least for me, they were the most interesting blades. They're, they are, first of all, so these would be something like S1 up to an SN, and uh, in this case, this is equal to, uh, by definition, by the construction S2, SN, S1. So I mean they're cyclically, they're defined up to cyclic order. Uh, remember that these, these describe, these are fine, uh, these are fine, uh, uh, blades around the point, yes? So uh, we call this a blade, and uh, maybe each of these is called a leaf. And in this case, um, with this you can always put one in the first one, but see, we'll have relations, and this is a one S, so for the basis, you have S1 contains one, and S2 contains the smallest coordinate not in S1. So these form a basis. And in the case, in the, again, in the plane as before, if we take here one, two, three, then these blades would be one, uh, two, three, and uh, and uh, the one with one, and uh, then the next one is two. So I think that this is this one, but uh, so. One and two, three. It should be the thing. So I think that this is the this one. So not the other one. So the other one, for instance, in this case, is equal to this plus this plus that minus this. Yeah, that's a relation. So again, we'll prove, in fact, that uh, if you take full blades, are uh, linearly independent. So if you take also the dots, then uh, uh, minus this, and this, uh, well, the we have the relation which I wrote last time, so I won't write it again, that it gives you the dot in terms of the other. And again, we'll write the, uh, we'll write the, uh, uh, the proof of this, it uses some number theory, Euler, beta functions, uh, so things uh, related to hypergeometric functions. And, uh, Oh, uh, yes, so I see here uh, a few more things I want to touch today. The structure of, uh, the structure of shards. Uh, this is uh, 
the shards are, are very uh, interesting. And uh, okay, so there we are in dimension zero. We have one dot. Can you see? So once again, this is a simplicial, the affine simplicial complex obtained by cutting with the special hyperplanes. Now, uh, we're going to discuss a representation next week. Uh, however, I want to say in advance that the special hyperplanes here, which give the whole structure and which have been extremely little studied, there are maybe four papers altogether in the last 50 years about them. The main hyperplanes are those uh, x uh, subset s equals to an integer. So the sum of coordinates without multiplicities, without signs. Uh, the sum of coordinates of a subset of coordinates it takes an integer value. Uh, the reason for that I understood it later, after I was working with them for maybe 10 years or so, is that uh, these are the hyperplanes which appear in, the, uh, in a SL2 over anything. So if you work with a tetrahedron or so, these are exactly the hyperplanes which appear there. And as we'll see in the representation part, they appear, for instance, in the Klebsch Gordon symbols, uh, 6J symbols, uh, all the things which are considered extremely complicated in physics and chemistry. So these are the hyperplanes which appear there. And in general, what we're building now is a higher version of the, of the gelfand settlin representations and of the, uh, of the, of the, um, uh, um, Zamolochkov and uh, uh, so uh, o, o, the the blades. W actually, I introduced the blades, but there there were the the structure of intertwiners as well. So anyway, let's let's look a little bit at this. Uh, so these have a descriptive uh, uh, thing included, and they will be part of the book. Uh, so here we are in uh, in one dimension. It's, uh, the, these are some of the hardest uh, lectures to give because there's really as much uh, material for this crystallographic part as maybe for the whole rest of the course. So this has to be compressed into very few uh, hours and we'll see what... Uh, so here is uh, here we are on a line. Yes, you see we have a, a code, uh, we have a dimension zero, the center. Yes, this is an integer point, and we have then the segment. Yes, so this is how how things look in dimension one. Uh, the segment has coordinates zero. Uh, so this the the uh, center lives in its own world of dimension zero, the, the edge has coordinates uh, as it's written here, permutations of zero, one. Zero, one and one, zero, yes? Uh, we don't, we write it only once, but here's the number of vertices, it's two. Yes? It's a bit degenerate. Now here, the next one are the shards in uh, two dimensions, three coordinates. So we have the center which comes from, uh, from uh, uh, dimension zero. Then we have this uh, edge which is placed in all kinds of uh, points. And then we have two triangles. The triangle standing up which, is, which has vertices permutations of one, zero, zero. As you can see here, permutations of zero, zero, one. 
If they are together, it means that they are permuted. Yes? And uh, the uh, opposite triangle, which has coordinates uh, 1, 1, and I mean, this we should put here 0, 0, 1, and uh, this one would have something like 0, 1, 1, yes? And, uh, and uh, its permutations. So uh, the edges here describe the boundary. Yes, so this one, the boundary of this is made when you make x1 is equal to 0. Yes, so this is 0, 1, 0, and, uh, and uh, 1, 0, 0, yes? And right here, this one is x1 bigger than or equal to 0. This is this, yes? So you see, it, it describes the half planes which bound it. Uh, as you see, there's only one thing here because the others are obtained by permuting the coordinates. So the permutation of coordinates is described here. Uh, this is just so that the rest is written, uh, uh, so excuse me, so this is here, right? And the other is x1 plus x2 is bigger than one, yes? Where would that be? Uh, this is uh, one, uh, uh, this is, yes, yeah, so this would be one, one, zero, and one, uh, zero, one. So I suppose that this one, I think, would be zero, one, one, and this one would be one, zero, one. And you have x1 plus x, uh, what is it, x2 plus x3, is bigger than uh, or equal to uh, uh, to one, yes? Uh, so, So that would be a boundary, yes? So it means that for all of them, x1 plus x2 is bigger than 1. So this, is, this hyperplane is x1 plus x2 is bigger than or equal to 1, yes? Okay, so the, 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 this one appears with all its permutations. Now here is a structure of shards in 3D. Uh, as you can see in 3D, you have a... Uh, 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 here the center, which is the integer point, but you also have a point with coordinates 1, 1, 1, 1 over 2. Um, such a thing, 1, 1, 1, 1 over 2. And of course, uh, all the zeros, and so this will call it a gem. It has a property that if, you, so this is all of it over 2. Yes, it has a property that if you take all the equations, all equations uh, which are x, s equal to integer, uh, determine it. So these are the vertices of the, of the, uh, uh, of the shards. They have not appeared before in the literature. For instance, there's no shard uh, other than zero, no shard with three coordinates. So this is the first one. As you can see here, the sum of these, of any two coordinates here is zero. And this gives you a system which is, uh, which has enough equations to determine it. So these are, uh, so the denominators, for instance, of shards, Uh, are uh, determinants of uh, Hadamar matrices. Either with zero and ones, or equivalently up to some factor of two with plus or minus one entries. So these are square matrices with entries zero, one, or plus or minus one. 
Uh, and they are known, uh, I mean, it's known that they're not classified or anything. So this is, uh, uh, the system here is clearly of this form because XS, this, is, this has only zeros and ones, yes? Xs is a sum of the coordinates with coefficient 0, 1. So the first shard appears in four coordinates, and uh, I'm wondering if I have any... Uh, uh, yes. Uh, this is a blue point here. Do you see in this? Yes, so this is uh, uh, the blue point in the middle of an octahedron. And you can see here that you have uh, white points, which are the integer points. Then you have the green edges, which connect, uh, uh, which come really from a lower core dimension. Then you have triangles standing up and down, which also come from lower, lower dimensions. And then you have these edges, a blue edge, uh, which, which connects the uh, gem in the middle to this. And, uh, and uh, then uh, right angle, triangle, uh, an octant. And the octants are of two kinds, positive and negative. And actually, as a fun aside, at some point I looked at these ohms, and on a, on a given triangle here, you can find whether it's a plus or a minus. So somehow the... the uh, the zones have this thing built in. One looks like a screw and the other looks like an unscrew. And people who make the zones, so I'm all the time in connection with, uh, with the uh, uh, CEO of the enterprise. And uh, they didn't know this. Okay, so you can see here, look, this is the previous edge. This is the, the edge between the gem, and we'll see when we make these honeycombs that the gems really explode into gems. So uh, you'll find the, uh, uh, for instance, the uh, lid of the Coco Chanel perfume bottle, Coco Chanel number five, is exactly the gem corresponding to this particular point, as you'll see. So the gems are really gems. And um, of course, zero, zero, everything zero is a gem. And the gems are taken, the numbers are taken uh, modulo one. Yes. Okay, and here, uh, so here you have one dimensional edges, here you have two dimensional things, so triangles, as I said, there, there are two triangles, one standing, one of these green things is uh, standing up and one standing down, yes? You, what it means is that you cannot send one into the other by permutation of coordinates. And uh, finally, in co-dimension zero, you have uh, four of them. Here in the middle is a number of vertices. So uh, here there's a very detailed description which would make, uh, I suppose, a chapter on gems. Basically, this is what I uh, what we know, and these are the gems in five coordinates. As you see, they grow uh, uh, super exponentially, like two to the power two to the n. In five coordinates, things are four dimensional, and so with the methods that uh, we used for the sculpture, they can be visualized. Uh, in particular, uh, so. You see, a regular thing, if you have a segment, I mean, it has two vertices, a triangle has three edges. But in principle, you could have, you know, more complicated gems. So what you do is you cut with these hyperplanes. And I wrote a program which does this, eliminates the degenerate ones. And so, so I hope to run it here in the spring on the supercomputer for physics and... Uh, and uh, one of uh, my colleagues here who works in uh, more applied things, uh, why, why would you need uh, you know, to go from eight coordinates? So I have them computed up to eight coordinates. 
uh, why would we go to nine, we have a million kinds of shots. And I, I told him that uh, that uh, step like this helps you uh, guess the uh, make make the right conjectures, guess the structure. So that would be very important. You can see here all kinds of things, but the one I want to to show you um, most uh, mo the most interesting one is this gem. Uh, is, excuse me, is this shard? Do you see this shard has 10 vertices? So the, we are here in five coordinates. So the shards normally should have five coordinates uh, in 4D. So the shards have five, co five vertices, the usual ones. Can you see this one has five, yes? But this one has 10. So it's a gem which when it, it's cut, it looks like a, some, uh, it's not a gem, excuse me, it's a, it's a shard which I call the big shard. So it's the first shard which is, uh, which, which has a very, uh, uh, which is not a simplex. And uh, it has a lot of consequences in, uh, in the representation part, which we will not discuss in the course, but which will hopefully be put somewhere else. Uh, again, this one has 10 vertices instead of five. So it has, uh, it has uh, uh, also 10 faces. So you see here, you can, uh, you can see the faces. It has only one kind of face. This face, which has instead of four, it has five vertices. That's a double, it's a double tetrahedron. So this is in 3D, the faces. So it has its faces uh, uh, 10 uh, double tetrahedra. And there are here all kinds of relations uh, which I explained in these notes. Uh, and uh, here are the gems, uh, both in, uh, in 3D in this picture, on the picture that you saw. And not the gems, excuse me, here are the shards. So uh, I have the gems in mind because I remembered not to forget to talk about them. And when we'll do the dual, which are some, uh, uh, some honeycombs, then the gems explode into a gem. So the points explode into the higher dimensional ones. So this is the opposite one, as in the Poincaré duality, the discrete form of Poincaré duality. Uh, let me mention also here, before I forget, by the way, of Poincaré and, uh, uh, and uh, curvature, Poincaré, uh, so that um, uh, we, uh, the most important maybe thing, which is on the, on the, uh, uh, it is on the poster, is a Riemann curvature, uh, namely if you work in four coordinates, but of course the, it appears also higher with more interesting uh, things. If you work in four coordinates, then uh, if you work in co-dimension uh, one, blades, uh, then you will have, um, uh, uh, something like this. Oh, I should mention here, uh, excuse me, one more, one more thing. Uh, the tree bases, the uh, forest bases, forest bases. Yes, now for, for, uh, for all co-dimension blades, Well, you have uh, things exactly like before, but because uh, you have in this case the grafting, did I call it grafting? Oh, the four, the number four here is uh, this uh, four, this is called grafting. Uh, that's what you do, as I was saying, if you, if you uh, work with uh, apple trees or something. 
you take a branch and you graft it on all kinds of things. So now if you work in, uh, so if you have a forest basis, then with grafting, you can make the first tree uh, without branches, because you can graft the branches to the, to the others, yes? So the first tree would have a set S1, which contains one. Yes, so this is a tree one. And the others would be uh, uh, comb trees. So this is, uh, the, the others would be comb trees. So these, these are comb trees, right hand side, and with lumps, of course, but uh, this would be an S2. So S2 contains the first label. Remember that these are labels of coordinates. First coordinate label uh, which is not, not contained in S1. Yes, so the smallest one, which is not in S1. And uh, uh, and uh, uh, the trees, so this, this is the smallest of the tree number two. And then similarly, S3 contains, uh, S3 would contain the first label which is not in the first two trees. And these, this would contain, the first two trees would be less than this, so, and so on. Yes, so this, these form a basis. And now this basis is actually uh, indexed by the same index set as the uh, as the uh, uh, blades themselves. So this is a basis, and in this basis, um, if you have a permutation, so if you have a permutation which starts with one, let me take it the non-degenerate case. Uh, so this is. Uh, uh, pi, let's call pi a permutation starting with one. So this is permutation unlumped just for simplicity, starting with one. Uh, remember that for blades, uh, blades are, the description is always invariant up to cyclic permutations, so you can put always one in the first. Uh, one first. In that case, you have a uh, uh, you have the, suc the successive minima. So there is a subsequence of successive minima. Namely, you have one. Then you have the next one is a such that all of these are bigger than or equal to A. So A is, uh, well, let, let's write, no, rather, let's write that A is a minimum um, among uh, things among those past one. So the value of A in this case is very clear. A should be, this is a minimum one after one, of all the things after one, we should uh, ask for our undergraduate, uh, yes, what's the minimum among all the numbers other than one? Two, exactly. So you see, uh, higher math makes, has an impact on the lower math. So this one is two here. And then you take uh, this, the next thing, yes, 
is first element, now we don't know what it is. Yes, this is the first smallest, smallest uh, knot in first two segments. And so on, yes? So if you have a permutation, you can decompose it this way. So you have a segment up to two, right? After that, you eliminate those and you take the minimum of what remains. And you have a segment up to that of the permutation and so on. And this, these, you can make these exactly into these trees, yes? So each of those segments becomes a comb tree. So, um, so you have the permutations, we start with one, are into one-to-one -one correspondence with these trees. And if they're lumped, also with the lump trees. Yes? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, yeah, these, uh, it, it, uh, uh, yes, in general, the Hasse diagram uh, gives you the distance to faces of a permetohedron. So if you have a function on the Hasse diagram, that's the same as a generalized permetohedron. Uh, you can take a permitohedron like this. You see the faces are indexed by subsets of one, two, three, four here. Yes, and then you can uh, move every face as you wish. That's a generalized permitohedron. Yes, the gems are not uh, in general. Uh, I mean, uh, there are some uh, conservation relations which which are not satisfied by gems. So a gem is, uh, excuse me, by shards. So a shard is typically not, cannot be realized as a linear combination of, uh, of plates or blades. Yes, so they're more general. And again, this, uh, this is a whole uh, new branch of research, but that will be done elsewhere. Uh, the ah, the last one minute, the clock. You see, this is a thing on the wall there, which is showing almost one. So this is, however, our clock. So if you are in the in a simplex, Yes, then the coordinates, so this, this, this coordinate is 4, 0, 0, and 0, 4, 0, and so on. So the coordinates, coordinates have uh, uh, some uh, n. So you take, an, uh, you take a clock, you divide it into 1 over n uh, portions, and you put here, now if you, if you have a plate, for instance, the relation is x1 uh, bigger than something, then x1 plus x2 bigger than something, and so on. Yes, uh, also lump things. So you could put here, the first one, let's take uh, a uh, less trivial example, let's say x3 plus x5, and so on, yes? So you put here the first one, this would be x3, up to the first hand. Then up to the next hand, you put uh, x, this one would be x4 here. So the next hand would be at x3 plus x4, uh, x3, x5 here, yes, x3 plus x5 would be this distance from the top, and so on. Yes, so you can put this way some hands of a clock. And inside the plate, these are bigger, yes? So this means that the, the hands, if you are inside the plate, 
move forward. Do you see X3 increases from here? So X3 is bigger than this. Yes? X3 plus X5 moves forward. But so that, so hands, hands move forward without uh, passing each other. Uh, so that describes all the inside uh, points of the blade. So they're parameterized by this clock. And this clock uh, uh, gives a, a special kind of map. And uh, again, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's proved to be extremely useful. So uh, once again, this clock parameterizes very well the, the points inside the plate, which is in a simplex. Yes, and if you let, uh, if you do the analogous thing, but not on a clock or so, if you move them on a line, then you get the parametrization of infinite plates. Uh, if things again move, move ahead and... Uh, so... Uh, oh, and the last, the, the punch line here, uh, please uh, uh, watch this. This is exactly the Riemann curvature. So this is a fundamental concept for physicists. This would be maybe uh, the most important thing. Namely, if you take the blades of co-dimension one, then you have, on the one hand, you have uh, blades in four coordinates. Then on the one hand, the trees, uh, you have trees of this form. And these are, so this is a forest. So these are anti-symmetric here, anti-symmetric, each tree is anti-symmetric. And you have something symmetric in the two trees. Yes? Because they're part of a forest. Remember, these are exactly the symmetries of R, I, J, K, L. Yes? Of the Riemann curvature tensor. And now by grafting, you can move it into one edge and the other one is grafted on the other. And this one satisfies the Jacobi Jacobi, actually, he was German, so it's Jacobi, and, uh, and in this case is exactly what was observed by Bianchi. Yes, so this is a Bianchi identity. And uh, I have computed the, uh, the exact matching between, uh, by symmetry, between various components of the Riemann curvature tensor inner basis, and uh, blades around the point. So there are 21. It looks like uh, they are exactly the number uh, of uh, degrees of freedom used in general relativity, which is 20, yes, for the gravitational tensor, plus another one, which could be a scalar, uh, something which is fully symmetric, which could be maybe the, the uh, the cosmological uh, constant or something like this. So let me stop here. I have covered a little bit of what's